communication, the human imperative. Camera, film, photographer, subject. The basic elements are the same, but the outcome is always affected by the motivation and the technique of the cameraman. As we continue our examination of photography, we see photographers at work from dynamic landscapes to the flash of fashion and the experiments that lead to creative new art forms. We also look at the promise of new technology and how images can be manipulated. Now, using the photographic collection at the Library of Congress as our starting point, we will try to read below the frozen surface of photographs and excavate the visual archaeology contained in them. Nature photography can take the viewer to places beyond their normal experience. But as they say, there's more here than meets the eye. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. To a modern viewer, William Henry Jackson's landscapes in the Yellowstone area of Wyoming give the impression of unspoiled nature, but they served an additional purpose. In 1872, his photographs persuaded Congress to establish the first national park in the U.S. Another pioneer naturalist photographer was Carlton Watkins. His images of the Yosemite area of the Sierra Nevada helped secure the land against development. Uh, they were showing people something that they didn't even know existed, and it gave the people a feeling of what was out here. And I think, uh, you know, those early photographs had a great deal of, co of uh, impact as to some of the decisions that were made in Yellowstone becoming a national park, for instance. To the left, or you want to go this way? Uh, let's stay sort of along this trail here. Okay, I'll wall. cut over. Here in the Colorado Rockies, Wendy Shadow and Bob Rosensky work in the sort of rugged terrain familiar to pioneers like Jackson and Watkins, tracking wildlife in search of what in the photographic process is called the decisive moment. We look for the very special moments, the special kind of light, the special reaction from the animal. Probably the most common question that we get asked of us is, how long did it take you to take that picture? About a five hundredth of a second? <laughs> and 20 years of observation. The more you can know about the animals and the environment and respect it, the better off you're going to be, and then the better the pictures will be. And that's probably what separates the professional picture from the average picture. We can share a very special moment that maybe nobody else will ever have a chance in their lifetime to see. I like it when people can have a response to our photographs. Uh, that they react to an image. And the worst thing is if they look at something and say, mm, that's nice. But when there's some sort of evocative response from a viewer, whether it's a, a moody, foggy shot of a bull elk in a meadow or a baby fox looking up at its mom, when there's a reaction from somebody, I'm thrilled. Today, Nature photography adorns the walls of art galleries throughout the world. But can photographs be appreciated as pure art? It was really a long, hard struggle to get the public to accept photography as an art form because the public, even today, still doesn't like certain things that, or certain subjects that photographers might portray because they feel religious subjects, uh, nudity. They feel that uh, those things are not the domain of photography. The pictorialist movement established in Europe around the turn of the century was determined to secure photography as an art form. The pictorialists strove to make art, and they looked at art as a model for composition, for 
ideas about form and texture and things along those lines, all the elements of art. They looked at art. They didn't imitate so much as they used the elements within art, within photography. It's a new form. In Victorian England, Julia Margaret Cameron, one of the leading pictorialists, was noted for her slightly soft focus, moody portraits that echoed the oil paintings they replaced. In the U.S., avant-garde photographers banded together under the leadership of Alfred Stieglitz. They included Gertrude Kaysbeer, whose work was regularly shown in Stieglitz's New York Gallery alongside other pictorialist photographers and the leading international artists and sculptors of the early 20th century. F. Holland Day, a pictorialist from Boston, shocked turn-of-the-century sensibilities with depictions of male nudes and the seven last words of Christ. A series of photographs in which Day portrays himself on the cross. These are subjects that can still raise eyebrows. The reality of it is that he chose that subject because he deeply believed in it, because he thought it was such a sacred subject, because he thought a painter can use this subject, a photographer as an artist can also deal with this subject. Day's archive of photos came to the Library of Congress in 1934 almost by accident. The 600 pictures accompanied a gift of papers relating to his career as a publisher of artistic books and manuscripts. No information accompanied the pictures, and they have only recently been cataloged, leading to a reappraisal of Day's work. By the middle of this century, artists tried to free themselves from the mechanical limitations of the camera. Man Ray took cameraless photography beyond the simple notion of placing objects on photosensitive paper. These are some pictures made with water smashing down onto photographic paper. Following that tradition, Adam Fuss continues to explore the possibilities of a form of expression that echoes the science and art of the first photographers. I'd been very, very interested in science. About that time, I became more interested in the arts. And photography had one foot in the world of, of science, in, in optics, in mechanics, in chemistry. For me, a successful picture, in a way, is something, when I look at it, when, when I take it out of the tube, I have to keep looking at it. I, I, have, I want to keep looking at it because there's something there that's um, compelling. The interaction between artist and camera defies precise understanding. The techniques adopted by an artist strive to communicate a unity of form in the ideal photograph. And the photograph itself is an interpretation, not necessarily a direct representation of reality. One of the freest forms of photographic expression has been glamour and fashion imagery. Are these images reflecting the values and directions of society, or are they shaping them? Photographers of fashion photograph the ephemeral and the temporary. And in many cases, these photographs freeze not only a moment, but a real attitude. The fashion industry has made superstars out of models who display its wares. Alongside those famed for their poise on the runway are the fashion photographers, many of whom are as rich and famous as the models they focus on. The work of Herb Ritz defines today's concept of high fashion photography. Every photographer has his own way of going about creating an image. And for me, I like to have my given set up, but I don't plan anything. I like to go for the moment. Okay, just look at me. Look at me. Short smile, head up. Good, good. It's you figuring out in the short time that you have what you want to go for and what best communicates that person's soul. Fashion photography might be considered ephemeral, but the work of one fashion photographer already has a place in the collections of the Library of Congress. Tony Frizzell started taking pictures in the early 1930s, and she quickly became a regular contributor to Vogue magazine. 
her portraits of, especially of women, um, have a tenderness uh, and really show the fragility of a woman, uh, but also the strength of a woman at the same time. It's a sort of double-edged sword. She was imaginative and dedicated to her art, often taking her models to exotic outdoor locations. It sets off kind of a, a fantasy. Once you get the image, you start thinking, oh, it reminds me of, and then people supply their own meanings to it. She sometimes called it Midsummer Night's Dream, which allows for a lot of imagination on the part of the viewer. She could have remained in the rarefied atmosphere of fashion photography, but during the Second World War, Frizzell switched from fashion to the front line, transforming herself into a photojournalist in bomb-ravaged Europe. You never see the horrors of war. She always tried to look at something, uh, a, a beauty. Even that child sitting in the rubble is a, a beautiful picture. This is from a study she did of a bombing in a neighborhood in London during a blitzkrieg in 1942. All the pictures in there have immediacy to them. In this one, the little boy has sort of a shocked look on his face to know that his family has been killed in the bombing, that his home has been destroyed, that he has only the clothes he's wearing and the stuffed animal. Makes it a very poignant photograph. Among today's documentary photographers, Mary Ellen Mark's images have introduced people to the dispossessed from across the globe. Where I make the images to show people a situation, a condition that exists, and to make them look at it, to force them to look at it. If it's a painful situation, to say you should look at it. Her photographs concentrate on the poor and outcast members of society, ranging from Indian prostitutes to runaways on the streets of Seattle. I suppose I want the people that look at my photographs to, to feel, um, to care about what they're looking at, whether it's, it's laugh or to cry or whatever. I just want them to have those, those feelings, those emotions. However quirky the subject, her images always elicit emotions. A precursor to the documentary camera style was the stereograph. They were an early form of home entertainment that could take people to exotic locations and present the human experience in three dimensions. In the stereograph, two identical pictures viewed together in a simple apparatus gave the impression of a three-dimensional view of the world beyond the living room. No subject was too remote. A series of pictures might show the adventures of an explorer or the downfall of a philanderer. Today, these images have taken on a new meaning as signposts of a journey into our cultural past. Old photographs help us examine societies both primitive and advanced, a visual archaeology. While stereographs were an informative and amusing diversion in their time, today they hold a trove of information about the way things once were. Each image holds evidence of life as it was. It's in the details, the furnishings, clothing, and manners. To truly see, we need only look. Despite obvious danger, Combat cameramen have captured forceful images that document the wars of this century. Their work derives from photos of the American Civil War and Crimean Wars. With the advent of aviation, photography offered a whole new perspective on conflict.
We try to see whether there are any, uh, not necessarily changes, but just unusual activity. Sophisticated aircraft and satellite surveillance has both civil and military uses, whether monitoring the world's resources or those flyovers that told us about the Cuban Missile Crisis. How easy is it to identify significant information from these photographs? It depends. It depends what question you're trying to answer. Some things you can answer very quickly with one image, uh, and often you can look in 20 seconds and immediately know the answer to the question. Other cases, you may have to review literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images, maybe not you personally, but maybe an entire team may have to do that. Hybrids of photographic and computer analysis are redefining the ways things are looked at and seen. One such system can actually identify an anonymous face from within a crowd. Do photographs always tell the truth? Do they always represent reality? In today's world of digital technology, desktop computer programs offer anyone the power to alter the basic structure and content of photographs. Which is what computer imaging is mostly about, is you take an image that exists and you change it to illustrate somebody in power's preconception of what the world should be, should be, even if it isn't. We are surrounded by photographic images. The camera can act as a sensory extension going where we can't. In medicine, cameras produce visualization techniques that enable diagnosis and treatments impossible just a few years ago. The Library of Congress is already taking its place on the cutting edge of this new technology with the National Digital Library. We probably have 12 million photographs here. We feel it's our duty to provide access to those collections. For years we've done it when people come to the reading room. The marvel of the internet and the marvel of the World Wide Web is that it's going to permit us to provide access nationally and internationally to hundreds of thousands of those photographs. Each day, students, scholars, and members of the public comb through the archives of the Library of Congress Photography Collection. Here's the material you've requested. What insight from the past just waits to be unearthed from these millions of moments frozen in time? The Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress continues to add to its collection with an eye to what future historians might find interesting. So what we're doing is developing the record, the pictorial record, the visual record of American history for our descendants to document the history, the achievement, and experience of the American people. Collections like the Library of Congress have so many pictures which um, epitomize a people, a time, a culture, knowledge that we don't really get in reading, but that is captured in the frame of the photograph. I hope we have stimulated your interest in photography as art, as document of record, as persuader and manipulator, and helped you look at photographs and our world a little differently. Now, most of the photographs you have seen in this program are housed in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. If you would like to know more about photography, check out some books at your local library or cruise the Internet and log on to the Library of Congress. Suggested reading and Internet addresses will be appearing on your screen. Well, thank you for joining us on our continuing journey to explore communication, the human imperative. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit jiu.edu to find out more.